Hi, everybody. See you. Uh, numbers are, are, are increasing. Everyone's joining the uh, webinar. Thank you for joining us here at the uh, International Water Resources Association webinar on World Toilet Day. Uh, we're very excited to have you here today. We have a great panel, a uh, very uh, diverse panel of, of, of practitioners and uh, people who uh, are more on the academic side. So uh, we enjoy having that kind of combination. And uh, we're just going to give people one or two more minutes to uh, join us here today in case anyone's running late. Um, so it's a good opportunity to go get yourself a final glass of water or a cup of coffee, uh, uh, whatever is appropriate for the hour where you're at, and um, maybe a notebook or something to take some notes. And uh, looking forward to talking to you soon. So we'll get started in just one or two minutes. Thanks. All right, everyone. Well, uh, it's a couple minutes after the top of the hour, so I'd like to welcome everyone to the International Water Resources Association uh, webinar on World Toilet Day 2020. We've had several of these World Toilet Day events um, each year, and uh, we, I think we're, our audience is growing, and uh, we're, we're able to focus each year on the different themes that, uh, that they've picked for the International World Toilet Day. Um, so this year, it's uh, water uh, toilets and sanitation climate change. So. Um, our panelists today include Amanda Lofin, the Chief Executive Officer at the Human Right to Water in Switzerland, uh, Diana Iskribi, the Executive Director at Earth Forever in Bulgaria, Ismet Kassim, who is an Associate Professor at the University of Georgia, um, Yes, and uh, Stefan Ruther, a member of the board at the Fecal Sludge Management Alliance in the Netherlands. So. Uh, this is a webinar hosted, um, as you probably know, by the International Water Resources Association. And the IWRA is an international network of researchers and practitioners who work on a multidisciplinary range of water resource issues. We are a nonprofit, non governmental educational organization. Uh, the IWRA, we provide a global knowledge based forum to bridge disciplines and geographies by connecting professionals, students, individuals, corporations institutions, everyone who's concerned about the sustainable use of the world's water resources. So we're really happy to have you all here today. And like I said earlier, we have a really great panel here today. Um, I think that we, we've really been able to pull together practitioners, academics, uh, people who are looking at the top fields, the topics that are um, very, very pertinent to today. And we have some topics that are, I think, would be more pertinent to a long term, uh, long term thinking. So. Um, so, as you know, um, the topic today is World of Toilet Day, an always exciting event. Um, this event, uh, which was established in 2001, was made official by the UN in 2013. It celebrates toilets and raises awareness for the 4.2 billion people living without access to safely managed sanitation. And it's all about taking action to tackle the global sanitation crisis and achieve uh, sustainable development goal number six. So, today, um, we're going to look at these issues and address the issue, the relationship between climate change and our adaptation with use of the sanitation systems. So just um, for anyone who's maybe not been to a few of our events before, let me briefly explain the format of today's webinar. So we are going to briefly start with each of our, um, we're going to turn this over to Amanda Lofin, our uh, moderator, but then uh, we will go to each of the panelists to give a short presentation. And then at the end of the event, we'll have time for your questions from the audience. So you should see about um, halfway down on the GoToWebinar control panel, you should see an area that says questions. If you type those in, uh, they'll come right to me and uh, Amanda. And then uh, at the time, uh, at the end of the event, when it's time for questions, we can send them off to whoever it is. So if something comes up during one of the presentations that uh, piques your interest, go ahead and type it in. Uh, and that way, we'll have the question ready at the end of the event. Uh, so when uh, it's time to ask. Um, don't, don't feel like you need to wait to the end. So go ahead and go ahead and say as soon as you want. Um, 
And then we'll also have recordings of the webinar as well as PDFs of the PowerPoint presentations on our website, www.iwra.org after the event. Um, so give us a few days, we'll have it up, and that way you can go back and watch the event as many times as you like, um, and then be able to use the PowerPoint slides in your, pres in your own work um, presentations. So um, with that in mind, I'd like to turn the floor over to our moderator, Amanda Lofen, uh, Chief Executive Officer at Human Right uh, to Water, Switzerland. Thank you, Scott. <clears throat> so connecting climate change and sanitation. Uh, most people would struggle to see the connection between what happens between the toilet and the global changes in climate. Maybe wastewater discharge and the environment, that's an easier concept to understand and closer. Take that a step further and connect the impacts of what we do at the community level to support water governance, and then the cumulative effect of poorly managed water resources, resulting in scarcer volumes of clean drinking water, water for irrigation and food and long-term effects on groundwater and the environment, suddenly the bigger picture starts to emerge. What's encouraging about topics like today's is that there is potential for practical solutions that can have an immediate and direct effect on longer-term resources. Community-based ad adaptation is a really powerful tool for creating sustainable change at local levels and in turn influencing the quality and volume of water at the river basin level. It remains for our experts today to give you some examples and experiences from around the world to encourage collective behaviours that can be seen to produce results for individuals. So if I'd like to, I'd like to first of all introduce our first speaker today, uh, Diana Iskareva. She's the executive director of Earth Forever in Bulgaria. Diana's been described by Reuters in 2012 as Bulgaria's sanitation buster. It's estimated that only 2% of people living in the countryside in Bulgaria are connected to some kind of sewage network, and in 70% of villages there's no solid waste collection at all. But since the 1990s, it's a problem that as a Bulgarian, Diana has helped to improve and put on the national agenda. As she says, it's a problem that was ignored and neglected during communist times and across the former communist bloc, and it's only now starting to get the attention it deserves. For her, water and sanitation are two sides of the same coin. So she's talking to us today about her knowledge about bottom-up efforts to enforce EU sanitation standards in Bulgaria. Welcome, Diana. Thank you very much, Amanda. I hope you can see my screen at the moment with the presentation. Yes, it looks great. Okay, so uh, I would use the opportunity to present Earth Forever, uh, which is a foundation that is a non-profit organization, non-governmental, based in Bulgaria. We were registered in 1998. Our mission is to work for sustainable development of communities via improved environmental management, economic prosperity and social justice. We look at water as an entry point for sustainable development and especially we uh, target our activities on women and youth as the agents of change. We are members of Women for Water Partnership, Susanna, Women in Europe for Common Future and other international organizations. And we are partners with various international organizations, among them Sir Optimist, International um, Secretariat for Water, Solidarity All Europe, Butterfly Effect. Also in Bulgaria, we work in, case, in some cases with the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Regional Development and Pub Public Works, Ministry of Environment and Water, National Ombudsman, as well as numerous numbers of local government schools, uh, community centers, women activists, uh, and youth activist groups. How about a sanitation sector in Bulgaria? This is mainly and almost everywhere top-down effort. Enormous investments have been done since 2007 when Bulgaria joined European Union. And actually more than 
uh, 3 billion euro was already spent on sanitation, as well as 2.5 billion more in the pipeline to be spent. Unfortunately, uh, what everybody sees is the poor outcome of these investments. According to European Commission review for 2019, which is the latest one actually, uh, this is acknowledged that Bulgaria is making serious um, investments to uh, comply with urban wastewater treatment directive. Uh, and the deadline for this, the last deadline for this was the end of 2014. Despite going investment in building uh, necessary infrastructure, mainly supported by EU funds, Bulgaria is still only close to 26% of wastewater collection, 2.4% uh, load collected is subject to secondary treatment, and only 6.7% 6, 6 of the wastewater load goes more stringent treatment. As a result of this, the Commission started intringent procedure against Bulgaria in 2017. And uh, according to the information the government um, supplied for, for this report, the, it is expected that by 2023, uh, Bulgaria will meet the requirements of this uh, wastewater directive, which is not correlating with the national strategy, which says that the last, the final patch will be done in 2032, which is very far away really from this date. Uh, why we are concerned about it? Because we follow the practice of the Court of Justice of the European Union, and in December 2016, the Commission decided to refer Italy back to the court, proposing financial penalties in the case covering 80 agglomerations with a population equivalent to more than 15,000 inhabitants. The Commission is calling for a lump sum payment of almost 63 million euro at the same time, they propose a daily penalty payment of about 350,000 if full compliance is not achieved by the date when the court issues its ruling. In Bulgaria, we start from a very broad base of incompliance. The negotiations after the starting of the procedure in 2017 started with this that the government said that uh, 200, our government said that 268 agglomerations with total population of 305,000 people will have wastewater treatment by 2025. At the same time, the Ministry of Environment and Water defines more than 600 agglomerations with less than 2,000 people equivalent with partial collecting systems discharged without any treatment uh, to fresh water and estuaries, which is tackles the Article 7 of the Wastewater Directive. And the national strategy, as I already mentioned, promises that by 2032, uh, we'll manage to reach all the requirements of the directive. If we make a correlation with uh, the Italian case, it will be a disaster for Bulgaria to pay all this money in penalties. Uh, are we prepared? Not yet. If we talk about the um, uh, directive, it is we are still lost in translation. In Bulgarian translation, we see 70 times uh, they used the term sewage systems, which is not even included in the English text. Collecting systems that is probably used as, uh, I mean, uh, is translated as equivalent of sewage system is used only nine times in the English text. We have still problems to identify population equivalent and many people in uh, uh, the governance 
in, in the government at local and, uh, and national level still believe that this means one person. And they don't consider anything that produces the same type of uh, waste, uh, like um, an, uh, domestic animals, which are still very broadly uh, used, um, very broadly grown in the rural areas of Bulgaria. Why it is important to have NGOs involved and uh, uh, at the same time, why the participation of NGO NGOs is really restricted. Uh, Bottom-up efforts, according to us, are extremely important, but they are blocked by current legislation due to, due to the powerful lobby of the large water and sewage companies that are, of course, natural monopolists. And every company that is doing something with uh, sanitation in Bulgaria is still called a sewage company. And they consider sewage as the only technology that can be applied. Uh, we are promoting this uh, document of the European Union that shows, of course, as probably everybody here knows that uh, extensive wastewater treatment technologies are as legal as centralized sewers in the European Union, if they reach the standard of wastewater treatment, of course. We are building such uh, pilot projects here and there, bigger and smaller, to show that it's easy to be built, so it's, it's very easy to be maintained. It can go together with dry, Toilets, it can go together with urine diverting toilets. This is the cheapest toilet that we were able to build, which is quite comfortable. And uh, it was built for a family that don't have, did not have until this moment any toilet. So they were using something that uh, would be called officially open defecation. Uh, we built also public facilities. Uh, with um, flush toilets to demonstrate that it is also possible to have a sustainable flush toilet shower uh, with a planted filter with small wetland area for wastewater treatment. Uh, it is also possible to have very luxurious and comfortable uh, clean and hygiene uh, domestic facilities that also are served by planted filters for the wastewater treatment and decentralized, decentralized treatment that imitates natural um, solutions, natural ecosystems. How we do this, Who, uh, how we do our contribution to uh, sanitation improvement in Bulgaria? As an NGO, of course, we are working a lot on raising awareness of institutions and population especially targeting women and youth. We are involved in training by doing, especially with women and youth. We empower women, women and youth, especially in the rural areas, to stand for their rights and for better sanitation for their communities. We involve the whole communities because we believe in this, that no one should be left behind. We organize community meetings, youth festivals, photo exhibitions, we submit statements to institutions, for example, for the new Water and Sewage Act. It's again a sewage, as you can see. I don't know what happened here. I don't see that. Uh, okay. So this is an um, exhibition that we organized. Uh, with Roma women that were part of our uh, project last year. And um, it is still um, not acceptable in Bulgaria to declare that you're Roma because immediately uh, you are looked as someone who is not, um, not among the best persons or the useful persons in the society. 
you see these women and um, they have they were very much involved in this project and you see their faces their eyes these are very active women and they are very strong and able to stand for their rights we are training women to build to do uh, composting to put tiles to destroy and build walls of toilets these are girls that um, are studying to be a construction engineers uh, and uh, they almost never have uh, practice hand-on activities they are most most of the time they are studying just theory uh, so we involve them in something that is really uh, helping them to understand how you can do some very simple things in plumbing. Uh, rural women were very much interested to learn more how they can do, uh, how they can maintain their facilities at home. Here is a group of women who are just finishing a planted filter to plant, of course, uh, the, the uh, vegetation on it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Diana. Um, are you able to release your screen? Thank you. Um, super, I see we have Alice joining us also. Thank you. So Di Diana, I really enjoyed your presentation. I love the fact that you're involving so many um, women, especially from the community and there's some really active work going on there. And I'm sure people will have questions for you around this. So please notice uh, anybody listening that there is the question section to your right of the screen and uh, any questions you can uh, that you'd like to ask please write them down and we'll collect them up for at the Q&A towards the end so um, I'm going to move on to our, our next speaker um, if I may go back to Alice our, Alice um, Aureli it is the Chief of Groundwater Systems and Set Settlements Section at UNESCO IHP in France. Um, she's a water resources expert with over 30 years of experience in groundwater resources. Uh, she's a researcher and a teacher, splitting her time between supporting postgraduate programs on transboundary water, hydrogeology and groundwater resources, authoring numerous publications and leading major developments in international law, such as the preparation of draft articles on the law of transboundary aquifers. Among her many areas of interest, she's sharing her ideas today about the link between groundwater resources and climate change. Please, Alice, take, um, take the floor. Amanda and, and, and friends and colleagues, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can you see the, just share your screen? Uh, do you have a PowerPoint? No, I don't have a PowerPoint. And I have to okay. apologize because uh, there was uh, an accident. I mean, uh, my computer collapsed. This is why I'm late uh, joining you. But these are the, the pleasures uh, of uh, working at home and uh, far from uh, all the possibilities to check immediately when an accident uh, arrives. So my, my PowerPoint, uh, unfortunately, I cannot show it. Uh, but anyway, let um, in 10 minutes, I think uh, uh, we can easily resume some of the most important issues related uh, to groundwater and climate change, in particular also related to access to water. Um, in last uh, few weeks ago, we, UNESCO and IWRA, together with the International Association of Hydrogeologists, uh, have organized uh, three days. Uh, uh, international conference uh, fully online and, uh, and the, the topic was exactly groundwater and climate change uh, so we we were able to um, to collect uh, uh, some very interesting uh, um, advice suggestions best practices uh, experiences uh, from a different part of the world uh, why we wanted to do this? Because uh, when you look at uh, the studies related to access to water, 
I mean, in, there is a human right to uh, climate change studies. You see that uh, the, the real uh, neglected component uh, is aquifers, is our groundwater resources, these, uh, these invisible resources that uh, require a lot of attention by uh, scientists, uh, policy makers, decision makers, managers, but at the same time is very much the last in, in the queue of receiving uh, the right uh, attention and investments. One, um, an immediately number to, to give you an idea, apart of the fact that, of course, we all know, other experts know that the the largest, the uh, real, real largest component of uh, fresh water in the planet uh, is contained uh, in, in the aquifers, uh, the, the coastal aquifers, deep aquifers, some non-renewable aquifers, like for example, in uh, the region uh, of uh, the Northern uh, um, Africa, where large aquifers very deep are non-renewable, that contains uh, fossil aquifers, what this means, means that uh, these uh, big box of, of, of fresh water were created uh, in a period where the climate was completely different to the one today. And the contemporary recharge now would not be able to uh, infiltrate enough uh, water to these aquifers if we are not capable to have a clear understanding of how much we can withdraw from this aquifer without considering uh, to completely uh, impact uh, in the negative sense uh, this balance of infiltration and, uh, and withdrawal. Why I say that? Because the, the right to water, the access to water for hygiene, for um, human health and, uh, and, and water activities and the environment uh, could be compli completely um, jeopardized by lack of uh, attention, governance and management of these particular aquifers not leaving our generation the possibility to, to leave to the new generation uh, these resources uh, in uh, an adequate uh, status. So UNESCO in particular is now looking very much to work in arid and semi-arid zones in, in uh, different regions of the world in order to, to give uh, member states and countries the possibility to, to have a better knowledge on, on groundwater resources and the aquifer, the aquifer system that uh, are geological uh, structures um, that determine uh, then uh, the quality and, and the quantity, the capacity of uh, use uh, of the groundwater resources. There is another issue that I would like to, to share with you is that most of these aquifers are uh, large systems that are shared by more than two countries, sometimes three, four countries. Uh, again, a number in uh, UNESCO has made an inventory of uh, the transboundary aquifers of the world, and uh, we have uh, listed already 592. Uh, 366 outside the EU region. That, in fact, is what uh, is uh, uh, the mandate of, of the UN and UNESCO to look at. Uh, outside the EU region that is already very much equipped uh, for managing water resources with the uh, European Framework Directive and the uh, Daughter Framework Directive on groundwater. So with 366 just under the aquifers around the world, you can imagine that we have 72 uh, inventoried in Africa. So in Africa almost uh, uh, each country shared an aquifer with a neighboring country. Most of the time, lacking the needed data in order to, to use and to, and to manage correctly these groundwater resources. 
most of the arid zones in Africa depends on groundwater resources, also for agriculture. So this is definitely an issue that requires much more attention and investment, financial resources. Uh, this is not the case yet, even if uh, recently with the, the AMCOV, that is the, the African Ministers uh, for Waters uh, com Committee, we are looking together in a new program launched by AMCOV, APAGROP, that is uh, the AMCOV Groundwater New Roadmap, where we, we try several institutions, uh, including, including UNESCO, as a, a UN agency active on uh, with AMCOV to create a capacity, improve capacity, capacity building in particular. Um, nowadays, with the online framework, um, we are using more and more uh, this uh, system to reach uh, uh, as much as young uh, people uh, and uh, an expert uh, in career. Another information uh, related uh, groundwater resources and climate change uh, is that uh, it is coming from, uh, from the main uh, debates and discussions and panels of, of the conference uh, that we have organized a few weeks ago, is exactly that uh, uh, if we are really looking at uh, um, improving uh, these, uh, the, the knowledge uh, between uh, the interface uh, groundwater and climate change, there are two main uh, levels that uh, needs attention. One is um, strategy and, uh, and scenarios for uh, modeling for uh, uh, the impact of climate change in different uh, climatic areas. And uh, we did uh, uh, an exercise already of 23 pilot studies in different regions of the world to look at uh, the recharge, so the, the precipitation and the recharge to these aquifers and uh, the, the way how the response from the aquifer uh, was in, in a different soil uh, aquifers characteristics and uh, as I say, the different climatic areas. And uh, at the same time, what is uh, the capacity and the role uh, that we, we believe is uh, very much important uh, of aquifer system uh, as containers uh, of fresh water to uh, help in putting together adaptation measures uh, to climate change. For example, aquifers can be replenished also artificially. So management of aquifer recharge is definitely a tool, a methodology with several technical uh, possibilities uh, that uh, I don't want now to, to list uh, here that could help uh, in replenish uh, the uh, aquifer that had been, um, let's say, strongly impacted uh, by um, human activities um, with raw, so water supply and, uh, and, uh, and uh, industrial or agricultural activities. Uh, then to restore the quantity and the quality of the aquifers. Of course, uh, to do that, uh, you need uh, some water to be injected. And uh, um, this takes us uh, to the consideration of how to manage better water reuse. I mean, how to reuse water how to consider the technologies and the methodologies that nowadays are at our disposal in order to make some of the water for our activities be reused and then to be used for management of aquifer recharge, for aquifer recharge. This is not accepted everywhere. Uh, there are several countries. There was a discussion, I had a discussion a few days ago with the former Minister of Agriculture of Morocco, and, uh, and, and she, she was, in, uh, she was on, uh, on duty for five years. And, and one of the most difficulties she had uh, looking at the methodology of uh, uh, water reuse and, uh, and definitely, um, I mean, um, consideration of uh, groundwater and aquifer replenishment was a solution 
had to fight with the agriculture uh, sector that didn't want to accept to use for agriculture uh, water re recycled or re-injected. So there is also a matter of consideration of education and capacity to improve the, the, the possibility of uh, access to water using groundwater wisely and adequately. And Amanda, I can continue to, to talk for hours. I'm an Italian, so you know you have to stop me. Um, but uh, I think that, uh, uh, and then maybe I stop there. You know, UNESCO is a, a co-custodian with the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe of the um, indicator C52. There is nothing else that uh, um, have a task to monitor with 153 countries around the world the uh, calculation about uh, uh, the um, how to 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 measure cooperation. Uh, what this means means that uh, we have uh, evaluated that there are uh, around the world 153 countries that share one river basin, one lake, one aquifer, one of the three or all the three together. And, uh, and I mean, in the SDG 6 uh, objective, uh, uh, the 652 indicator, so these indicators are under our responsibility should help us to every three, three years until the end of the Agenda 2030, have a, a, an idea of the status of uh, the cooperation between countries uh, about uh, these uh, transboundary waters. What I can say now already, because we are already in the second phase of our monitoring of the indicators with UNEC, well, uh, if river basins, uh, transboundary river basin, international river basin, and uh, lakes, uh, transboundary lakes, uh, can count uh, on quite uh, an interesting number of, uh, I would say, agreements, uh, coordinations, uh, and in particular data, data about uh, characteristics uh, of uh, precipitation, quality, quantity, uh, use, management. The poor apparent uh, is still, and again, and again, uh, aquifers. Alice, we're losing you um, a little bit. We've lost your video and... Alice, I, I think it might be helpful um, if we uh, stop your video because we can't hear you very clearly. And maybe I could suggest that uh, people ask questions through the question uh, chat on the right hand side. And we could come back to you in the Q&A um, with some final um, answers to, to those because uh, it's quite difficult to hear you at the moment. Um, if, if I may, I'd like oh, to... I apologize, introduce... I told you I had, uh, I had my computer no, going. No, don't worry. Anyway. Don't worry, Alice. We'll come back to you in the Q&A and it gives people a chance to ask you questions that they particularly uh, like to have answered. So um, if that's OK, we'll move forward to Isma Kasim, who is based at the University of Georgia. Um, Isma is an assistant professor in food microbiology and safety, and he previously worked in research at Ohio State University in the States. He's published widely in the areas of food and contaminated water, and most recently looking at the spread of diseases through irrigation and wastewater. He's sharing today some of his findings on the potential impact of water quality on the spread and control of COVID-19 in Syrian refugee camps in Lebanon. Please take the floor, Isma. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the topic that I'm going to discuss today is uh, is complex and it involves multiple nations and multiple global challenges. Uh, but water is in the heart of uh, of this uh, issue. 
So uh, before I, uh, I start the discussion, I'll, I'll give some introductory material about the countries and their challenges. So we're talking about Lebanon, which is a small Mediterranean country, Eastern Mediterranean country, uh, which and is bordered by Syria mainly. The country is relatively small, Lebanon, uh, and uh, the population is around 4.5 million uh, uh, individuals. Now, as many of you might have known, uh, Lebanon was considered one of the uh, maybe most touristic countries in the uh, Middle East, in the region. It has a, uh, an ancient history uh, and a very vibrant culture. However, uh, the country is currently facing its one of the, uh, if not the most uh, grievous economic crisis in its recent history where the economy collapsed, uh, basic uh, services are threatened, threatened, and access to uh, uh, food or availability of food uh, are becoming um, uh, an issue. Um, and of course, Lebanon has witnessed lots of challenges in terms of uh, political instabilities, and uh, in terms of uh, a civil war that raged for 20 years, and uh, many uh, um, uh, issues related to corruptions, which took a toll on its infrastructure. Um, uh, wastewater uh, uh, is a major problem in Lebanon, and uh, and it's a, also a major problem because Lebanon is one of the few countries in the in that region that are relatively rich in water resources. But with the wastewater and infrastructure uh, uh, problem, um, the, that, uh, that resource is threatened. And given that water is becoming, or uh, usable water, uh, is becoming uh, more and more scarce in the region, uh, having issues with pollution uh, is a real problem. Uh, not only uh, wastewater uh, doesn't only affect uh, it actually affects uh, all water uh, ways in Lebanon, including the Mediterranean Sea, uh, based on our study, uh, and then um, all the rivers in Lebanon uh, um, face uh, a, a major issue with pollution. Uh, and that's again related to um, uh, dumping wastewater, untreated wastewater, uh, into waterways and industrial ways, other uh, other ways, but mainly wastewater into uh, uh, rivers and and into the into the sea. Now, uh, this is a study that we have done uh, recently, uh, still unpublished, but where we looked at all the major rivers in Lebanon, and they are uh, you know 15 major rivers. And we looked at indicators of fecal uh, pollution, um, uh, and the indicators, bacterial indicators of fecal pollution. They include fecal coliforms, uh, a group of bacteria, and E. coli. So we characterized both. And in this graph, what you see is the name of the river, and then we sampled upstream, the midsection of the river, and downstream. And we quantified uh, uh, the number of fecal indicators that, of course, they, they tell you there's a, a possibility of fecal pollution in the water. Um, as you can see, uh, they were detected in uh, most samples were, were positive. The line, the dotted line that you see here is uh, uh, the threshold for recreational use. So anything above that line, that means it's not the water is not recommended for recreation use. Uh, not only this, when we looked at a different indicator that uh, where this now dotted line indicates use for irrigation, also you can see that the majority of the samples, the majority of the indicators were above that line, which indicates, and actually it confirms, that there's a, a widespread uh, pollution, fecal pollution, unfortunately. Uh, in Lebanon. So we have widespread pollution, we have an economic crisis in the country, uh, uh, we have political instability, and then, of course, like every other country, uh, Lebanon was hit with a COVID-19 pandemic, and currently the country went into uh, another lockdown because of elevated uh, levels of uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, cases. The numbers are increasing. Uh, why am I telling you this? Because this also cross section, it, it, it cross interacts with the, uh, the problem in Syria. 
uh, probably many of you have heard about the civil war in Syria. Uh, this is Syria post-war, this is Syria uh, 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 during the war, the war is still raging right now, and many of those of the Syrian uh, uh, population were displaced, and many of them took refuge in Lebanon. It's estimated, the numbers vary, but it's estimated that around 1.5 million Syrians took refuge in Lebanon, a country of 4.5 million people. Of course, uh, as I said, there's an economic crisis currently. Uh, the infrastructure is uh, uh, is suffering, so the influx of the refugees uh, increased, of course, the problem. Uh, so these dots that are in red, these are where the Syrian refugee camps uh, are located. Uh, many of the Syrians that uh, uh, fled into the country are living in makeshift camps without access to proper sanitation, without access to proper uh, uh, um, uh, uh, latrine facilities, um, uh, and, no, and without access to uh, 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 usable water, whether it's for drinking or for dom other domestic purposes. And as you see that the concentration of the camps, the, dot, the red dots here, uh, is around rivers, uh, mainly around rivers, which means that they have access to river water and they use river water and of course any waste that's coming from the camp is uh, channeled to the river water. Uh, this problem is being tackled currently but uh, it's it's widespread. Uh, uh, in the, so we have water that's contaminated being used by a, refu a refugee population and they are also uh, in turn contributing uh, to the pollution there. Uh, this is regarding the surface water and also considering uh, uh, urban water, urban water in Lebanon is also considered to be widely uh, contaminated. So even if there's access to um, uh, urban water by the refugee, that water might not be necessarily usable. This is a study that we have published also recently where we looked at the drinking water and the well water in one of the camps. And what we have found that actually it was the water were polluted with uh, a specific strain of E. coli, which is a fecal indicator, um, and those strains were multi-drug resistant, and uh, meaning that they are uh, they harbor antibiotic resistance uh, genes for very important clinically important antibiotics, and those antibiotics are, uh, resistance genes are transmissible. So now you have a susceptible population, the refugee population living in un, uh, under un, uh, um, uh, uh, under uh, uh, harsh circumstances uh, and they are their immune system is already stressed and now they are being exposed to contaminated drinking water and domestic water that harbors uh, um, uh, antibiotic resistance genes and probably antibiotic resistance resistant pathogen which means that they are prone now to infections right uh, um, uh, just to show you some of those, I know this might be too technical, but just to show you that some of those strains that we're talking about, that some of those bacteria, they carried up to 20 and 15 different antibiotic resistant genes. So this is a severe issue because this population that's prone to infections uh, now uh, uh, are, are losing, the, you know, these uh, infections are resistant to intervention, meaning antibiotics won't be, a, uh, won't be effective in, in treating this population. This is another study that was done also on, in the camps and we found a pathogen carrying those antibiotic resistant markers it's called uh, Pityus mirabilis. Uh, this pathogen causes uh, a plethora of uh, symptoms including respiratory infections uh, which is uh, important and you will know why in a bit. Now the, what this graph shows here is the use of um, uh, what we refer to as last resort antibiotics in Lebanon. These are antibiotics that are used only when everything else fails. And you can see that after the influx of uh, uh, the Syrian refugees, there was a spike between 2, uh, 211 and 213 in the importation of those drugs for use, which indicates that multi-drug resistant infections are increasing in the population. Now, of course, this graph does, is not divided uh, according to the Lebanese population or according to the Syrian population. However, there's a marked increase that coincides 
with the influx of uh, uh, refugees into uh, into the country, meaning that we these infections are uh, uh, are increasing. And if you remember, I mentioned that most of the uh, refugee camps uh, are in next to waterways and in agricultural areas. We found that the water, even the irrigation water in uh, in these locations, were contaminated with these types of bacteria that were resistant to antibiotic. Now, it's it's really uh, uh, a good thing that uh, you know, World Toilet Day coincides with the World Antibiotic Awareness Week because they collide in this particular uh, circumstance. Because uh, antibiotic resistance, especially in uh, a susceptible population, uh, threatens, uh, uh, it, it's a huge risk. Uh, uh, to, to humanity, and the numbers that are uh, expected, the casualties that are expected are too high and too severe. So what does this mean in terms of COVID-19 to the refugees? Well, the refugees being exposed to pathogens, bacterial pathogens in the water, that will uh, reduce their immune system further, they reduce their immunity further, making them more prone to infections. So they are more prone to infections with COVID-19. That's one of the things, especially when they are exposed to respiratory uh, uh, pathogens, and we know that COVID-19 is also a, a respiratory pathogen. So, so they are uh, uh, prone to COVID-19 infections, and when you have this many uh, uh, refugees, an outbreak would be catastrophic. So um, the contamination of their drinking water and, uh, and domestic water, their proximity to contaminated water, uh, river water, needs to be revisited and needs to be addressed uh, as soon as possible. Um, the, um, the, the virus itself in the literature, the SARS-CoV-2, is known to be shed in, in fecal matter. Uh, and uh, there are now evidence that it's not only shed in fecal matter, but it also can be infectious in, in fecal matter. This is a, there's a bunch of studies out there that uh, highlight the potential of transmission of COVID-19 via the fecal oral route and uh, highlight the importance of uh, um, the detection of uh, SARS-CoV-2, the COVID-19 virus, in uh, fecally contaminated waters. So if the population is being uh, uh, assaulted by, for lack of better terms, by uh, uh, um, antibiotic-resistant pathogens, and then they are being exposed to uh, to the virus in uh, uh, in their wastewater. Then uh, there's a huge possibility that the population is at a, a serious risk of contracting the infection. Um, uh, the last thing that I, I want to point out that this issue that we, we're referring to, uh, it amplifies, meaning if, uh, if someone is infected and they are shedding uh, the virus in their feces and in their urine, and they are sharing the facilities, whatever facilities that are available, the latrines the, uh, available in, in the refugee camps, uh, that can facilitate the transmission of the virus in that population. If the fecal matter ends up in the river and they reuse the river water for any other purposes, and uh, that also uh, um, increases the uh, cycle of infection, and this and the risk is uh, um, uh, affects also the hosting community, and also the hosting community being uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, in Lebanon we have uh, there's there are lots of cases. That also affects uh, uh, um, uh, the camps. So there's a cycle that's going on there. So that's my talk for today. I hope I was able to shed a light, some light on this uh, important topic. Uh, and I will leave with a conclusion that, uh, that with the with a message that these refugee communities across the world, not only in Lebanon, um, during a pandemic, really, really uh, require at, um, attention and funding and access to uh, safe water. You cannot achieve uh, sanitary conditions, you cannot uh, fight infectious diseases without providing them access to uh, safe waters. Thank you. Oh, thank you very, very much, Ismat. Very, very interesting, actually. I've, I've heard uh, a number of organizations trying to track traces of COVID 
a virus in uh, wastewater, but I haven't really thought about the reinfection uh, aspect of it as you're talking about this, especially with vulnerable populations like this. It's a, it's a really big issue. And um, I'd just like to encourage um, anyone listening in that if you've got specific questions that you'd like to ask um, to Isma, please uh, send them on the on the question chat and we'll ask them uh, at the end. So stay on the line, please. And um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker now, um, Stefan Reuter. Um, he's a member of the board at Fecal Sludge Management Alliance in the Netherlands. As the former managing director of Border, uh, Stefan has over 20 years of experience in the sanitation and FSM sectors, working in Asia and Africa, and well placed to speak to us today about his topic. He's passionate about ensuring sanitation for the unserved and making lives livable. The, um, the vision at FSM is a world where all people everywhere enjoy equitable access to safely managed and dignified sanitation services which recognizes and treats human waste as a valued resource, improving health, reducing poverty, and safeguarding the environment. Which segues nicely into his topic today on opportunities for sustainable sanitation in climate action, lessons from Africa, Asia, and the Americas. So please, um, Stefan, would you like to speak? Right, you need thank to you very much. <laughs> can you hear me? I can. Yes. Okay, excellent. So thank you very much, um, everyone. Happy World Toilet Day and congratulations for this nicely put together um, webinar. Um, I, my background, as Amanda just said, is more from the practical side of things. I did my first um, practical training some 40 years back as a young volunteer in Zimbabwe, Africa and since then have been pursuing um, activities as um, training as a bricklayer and then working as a civil engineer. So really this is a practical experience. I would like to highlight um, in my talk the development from an urban perspective, but let's start here with some uh, figures from today launched report from WHO and UNICEF, the state of the world sanitation. And we learned that um, 2017, we, we, we were like 4.5, 4.8 billion uh, off track. Now we have still 4.2 billion people who use sanitation services that uh, leave the humans without um that, that, that are not treated right so we have only 10 years left to 2030 and if we continue at this rate of progress uh it will be the 22nd century before we really can um have progress so we can't continue in this uh track and we know that the urban population um, in Africa until 2050 is going to double. So the pressure on water resources, whether it's from groundwater, uh, surface water, um, it will increase. So the outlook is really that even slums in urban areas have not been reduced in size. So beside what um, Asmat was just presenting on refugee camps, which is also an increasing problem, we have informal urban settlements that are still going to be more than one billion um, in the next years and proportionally growing. So there are situations, and this is a slide from the city of Kulna in Bangladesh, Formerly, Bangladesh has a coverage of 99% of um, access to sanitation, meaning access to toilets. But in, in, in the right side, you can see that everything which is in yellow means that there is no containment. Or if you look at the top right pictures, no containment means um, the content of the toilet is just discharging into the open. 
or there is um, from many parts uh, no safe treatment, no safe transport. So this is what we call, um, although people will have access to toilets, it's, it's like institutionalized open defecation because uh, a toilet alone will not solve the situation. Um, so growing cities, growing sanitation problems. Um, I would like to, to uh, bring together the perspective from uh, water resources and from the service uh, community, and I'm using a slide from the World Bank. So um, in principle, we all want to reach, uh, we want to fulfill the SDG 6 on water and sanitation. And we are all relying on water and natural, other natural resources. We need infrastructure, we need to build stronger institutions, we need to manage the water. We've heard that from Alice. Managing so that it's available for multiple uses now and for future generations, and we need to include everyone. And there are national sources of financing and international ones. So I think on those principles we can we can all agree. But um, along this chain, if we do this well, this is where we are uh, strengthening the resilience of people, where we are strengthening the health, the capacity to um, resist to external changes, fluctuations, or even shocks, whether it's weather, climate, or other events. So the resilience pathway is very essential um, in, in those uh, in, in the water sector, as you all know. Now, um, the current policies and practice are not providing services for all, as we know, and it's very unequal that from the sanitation perspective, and I'm taking an example from Dar es Salaam here, that the expenditure on sanitation mainly goes to sewers, but there is only a small part of the population which is using that. So the majority of poor people are left unserved. And I'm, I'm using, I'm sharing a, a slide um, shared by, by uh, Roshan Tresta from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So you can see the harsh divide between those areas in town which are better off and which may have sewers and then the informal settlements with, where, where there are much more people living unserved. So I would like to, to give you a visualization on how services for all what they could look like you can you you can see on the center top that there are a number sorry i'm going back a number of households connected to a shared septic tank you could also have individual pit latrines in in those areas um, then you have an area which have you have on the down right side of the picture where there are a number of households who don't have their own sanitation facility on their own premise because they're just renting and there's no toilet. So they are going to use shared facilities uh, by a number of communities and you have at that shared facility access to treated water, but also toilets or showers and the wastewater is treated directly underneath the system. Uh, in this case, even starting with anaerobic digestion, recovering biogas from the wastewater, just to give you an idea. And also in urban centers, which are not connected to central sewer systems, you can have smaller size wastewater treatment being collected, wastewater being collected from individual households. And then at the down left side, when there's a spot available um, to treat the wastewater in different stages, different steps. You can see there's first anaerobic treatment underground, then you have uh, constructed wetland just like Diana Iskreva in her first presentation was referring to in um, smaller centers in, in Bulgaria, like for 1,000 inhabitants, 
So this is again, the technical solution is there and there are a number of options. The key part then will be to operate and manage them safely. The principles and the solutions are there. So this slide is for you to visualize what we're talking about when it comes to sanitation solutions in urban areas. Now, here comes a little bit more um, developed overview on um, where, where on the left side of the diagram, you see five basic urban sanitary services when it comes to solid waste, storm water drainage, latrines, septic tanks, and sewerage. Each one has a safe service chain, which is illustrated from left to right. Now, the delivery of these services in urban centers are constrained by the way land is managed and owned. For example, is there road access or the removal of solid waste, fecal sludge and septage? Is there frequent flooding due to runoff from build-up areas and the occupation of natural drainage channels, buffer zones? Are many dwellings rented so that the tenants have no motive to invest in making sewer connections or building a pit latrine? Is there enough space on a plot for a septic tank and a soak away? So on the right side of the diagram, you can see downstream treatment and disposal facilities. These are also constrained by physical planning and land use control. For example, has the land been allocated for sanitary landfill and fecal waste treatment facilities? Is it near enough to be viable for service providers without being too close to local residents? Are treated end products at an economical or viable distance from their potential markets? So in practice, the safe service chains often break down or are simply not there. Latrines and septic tanks often overflow, deliberately or not, into the surface drainage system. Now, the fecal waste may be dumped into the drainage system by unscrupulous operators or overflow from sewers and broken down pumping stations. And the drainage system itself may be blocked by uncollected solid waste. The net result of all of this is fecally contaminated water flowing through the urban area, often overflowing and spreading disease to citizens, polluting rivers and land downstream. Now the poorly maintained and operated treatment facility in their turn and leach it from those landfill sites add further to the downstream pollution. So this is another uh, way here to look at the situation in, um, in an entire way. We start at the left regard, um, regarding the sanitation value chain. Everything starts with a toilet, with a pit, with a toilet connected to a septic tank or to a sewer. Then comes the emptying part, the conveyance part, the treatment part, and then the part for end use, reuse. Um, so this logic comes from a publication do, um, done by AIRWAC, Swiss Federal Institute for Aquatic Science. And what we see underneath is that you may have business as usual, water toilets, water flush toilets connected to sewerage networks, pumping stations with all the problems they bear until the treatment. And then you have not networked systems, which is the much bigger part in years to come. And this is where the real the people live, which don't have access to network solutions. So you can have a latrine or a septic tank emptied by a vacuum truck or even by hand uh, emptying, by manual emptying, and then transferred to a local treatment plant. So then you go from the pre-treatment to final treatment and use. And you can have, that's the lowest range, container-based system. So that's not a pit latrine, but that's a, say, a small container which is emptied more frequently and which is collected from households, transported, treated, and then made ready for end use. Now, the point here is that we need, of course, to expand and improve the effectiveness of sewer systems. 
So it's not one or the other. We need both. We need to Im Im improve and we need to have more connections, including for poor customers in densely populated urban areas. But we also need to deliver improved toilets at scale for those who lack them and develop sanitation solutions for rented accommodation and challenging environment. And we need to establish viable fecal sludge management systems. And of course, and that's the link to the, the, the climate part here, we need to reuse more of the treated material, whether it's water nutrients um, or take out the energy from transformed treated wastewater. So in conclusion, and uh, from, from sharing these slides with you, um, Scott, I think that uh, we might need a more specific uh, or offer a more specific webinar on all the treatment technologies and opportunities. But um, the conclusions at this point of time, I would like to offer that, um, yes, investing in sanitation systems, because we are not only far off track, but we are also strengthening resilience capacity for climate change adaptation. It's a very valuable investment also protecting future water resources. The systems perspective means that we go beyond just the collection, the treatment and, and, and the reuse. We need to look at the structural challenges, the institutional challenges, the political dimension. When it comes to selecting treatment systems, we need to select or prefer those who can run without requiring external energy. So, there are a number of gravity fed systems which can treat wastewater and uh, these should be clearly preferred. Treatment systems should wherever recover, reuse water, energy and nutrients. And of course, that was the, um, that, that's clear for everyone. If we want to protect groundwater and surface water resources, we need to invest in sanitation. Um, in the presentation, you will have a number of references where you can have more detailed information, even videos and uh, more details. Um, what is happening today on World Toilet Day? Of course, I mean, if we want to reach out, it's not only about technical documents, but the first one is referring to a shit song published by the World Toilet Organization uh, from Indonesia, and really they are bringing everyone into the picture. We're not talking only technology, we, we are breaking taboos, we need to be more inclusive. But of course, a number of events and a number of uh, reports which have been uh, launched today. So thank you for being with us here in this event, but there are a number of other links which you may want to use in order to deepen your information. And let me just um, use this last one for um, referring to the link with uh, COVID-19, uh, the disease um, and sanitation. From what we have learned so far, uh, yes, not investing in sanitation poses a big risk of having too much uh, fecally contaminated uh, surfaces and, and waters. And um, as Matt was referring to the drinking water being contaminated even by um, um, micro uh, organisms which are resistant to antibiotics. So um, from what we have seen specifically regarding the COVID-19, um, there are very, very small and, 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 and few studies only which indicate that fecal matter from, uh, from the toilet uh, will still be infectious. Asmat referred to some. Um, the, the, the documents I have been uh, looking at beyond the Chinese documents, um, we have not found, also, not in, in Europe, uh, not in North America, um, fecal matter still being infectious, so that the danger, the risk, for uh, those who are emptying, pit emptying, is huge. Coming in contact with fecal matter, they need to be uh, protected, but the rate or the additional burden 
um, of um, getting 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 sick from COVID, attracting the disease from being um, in touch with with um, um, wastewater. There are numerous diseases, and uh, but from but the, the the virus, we haven't seen much evidence that it's coming um, out of um, the wastewater or fecal sludge. Yeah. So um, I would like to close with uh, the invitation for the next fecal sludge management conference, which is happening end of May, early June in Indonesia, and this is where all the world uh, specialists, uh, practitioners, business people coming together um, regarding the largely unsolved issue of fecal sludge management. Thank you very much and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Back to you, Amanda. Oh, thank you very much, Stefan. I, I particularly liked your, your statement that it's uh, institutionalized open defecation. I don't think I've heard that before, but I, um, I appreciate your introduction to the range of technical solutions that there are available in this field. And it's, uh, there is no shortage of technical solutions. It seems that the issues are potentially more around how do we afford them? How do we persuade people to uh, invest time and resources into that? Um, so I'm going to have to ask you my own questions since uh, we don't have any questions so far on the chat. So I'm, I, if I can perhaps encourage people to send in their questions, but in the meantime, I will go back to some questions that I have outstanding after listening to all your lovely presentations. Scott, do you have, do you have yeah, one? The, the questions are in the question section, not in the chat section. Yeah, I don't have, I don't see any, hold on. No, I, there, I oh, yes, one. there is. Oh, I didn't open it up properly, clearly. Okay, great. Oh, great. Loads of questions. All right, uh, let's yes. work through these then. Um, oh, very specific. Um, let's go to Diana first, since she was the first to speak. Uh, one from Marriott Verhoeven. Cohen. Uh, who thanks her for her presentation and she obviously knows the project very well and she said do you have confidence in the government to implement the eu guidelines by 2025 and if that could be done maybe the eu um, fines can be postponed or cancelled so maybe a, a question and a, a suggestion at the same time diana would you like to answer that um it's a difficult question because i cannot answer of course for the government but i have the feeling that the way the government tries to solve the issue will not solve the issue uh, because uh, the government sees only something like centralized wastewater treatment facilities sewers and wastewater treatment facilities that is very high very expensive technology and it introduces them even in places where only two, three houses are connected to the sewer. So this is not the way to meet the, the goal. And Stefan already talked about it, that actually there are lots of technologies, uh, but there is not willingness to approach these technologies. There is not, in Bulgarian case, there is... Um, um absolutely uh, how is it the uh companies uh, water supply and sewage companies they want to preserve all the possibilities for themselves and to build only centralized sewers even in very small places which will make the water unaffordable the facilities unaffordable and this is well known from the and everybody in the sector. So, so that's actually what you meant when you said that bottom-up solutions are blocked by the current legislation when you were giving your presentation. Um, yes, um, even, if, if, even the legislation, even in the legislative mm -hmm. documents, it when we talk about wastewater treatment or about sanitation, they're mm -hmm. using only the word sewers and wastewater treatment uh, plants 
So these are the only technologies actually that the legislation acknowledges as, as existing. Stefan wants to add something. <laughs> I, 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 I just, can I just um, add one, one sentence? Um, sorry, yeah. Amanda. So, Diana, yeah. uh, thank you for, for bringing this European perspective. Um, there was 12 years ago at the International uh, Year of Sanitation, a report from the uh, Women Engaged for a uh, future, Common Future was published and uh, reminding us that in Europe we have 20 million people without access to sanitation. And this is exactly what Diana is talking about. So we're not only talking about the South, we're talking about being blocked in our own highly developed Europe. And, 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 and that's mainly referring to people living in communities smaller than 2,000 inhabitants, thus not being covered by the Urban Wastewater Directive and our blockage um, and nobody daring to take a risk of introducing technologies which are available but which are not covered by our um, institutional framework. So it, this is the need for organizations like Diana's to push together with other partners for um business unusual and it's not that it's just not mainstream you know these solutions do exist and we have a small fraction of uh constructed wetlands and decentralized solutions so thank you for that and sorry for <laughs> no in fact i was going to i was going to lead into a question to you on that stefan since it certainly sounded like it was in your area of expertise and i don't think it's it's certainly not isolated to that part of the world and I'm, I'm just, if I may ask you, Diana, do you, do you feel as if um, the limitation is because the, 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 the government doesn't sub, um, trust the private sector or the communities to do the work themselves? Do you feel like they could be encouraged to do more if the government had more trust and there were some standards built in? Or do you feel like it's really just uh, institutional systems that have been in place for so many years and you can't and it's, it's more difficult than that more deep rooted i believe it's all of it <laughs> together yeah. Amanda, mm. uh, really but in our case uh and at the moment it is spoken a lot openly about it I, uh the government bulgarian uh, centralized government national government is looking at EU support for cohesion as endless uh, source of money that they can uh, channel on their uh -huh. own which, without opening these uh, possibilities for other participants uh, like uh, small business, like NGOs, to even to participate in discussions, not only into um into discussion of how to use this money but not not just to use the money but also to to give their opinion about how this money should be used in the best way Fascinating. And actually as i said enormous amount of money mm -hmm. was spent because we at the moment yeah. are something like only six million people in this country so yeah. if you spend yeah. six billion to supply six million that already have a significant uh, level of services, it is really too much money. Thank you. Um, right, so we have a few other questions here that we might like to get through. One of them is easy. Yes, the slides will be available um, online, so that's, that's dealt with that one. Um, there's a question here for Alice if she's still around. Are you Alice? I can't see your uh, video at the moment. Um, Can you see me? Uh, I'm okay. Hi, hi, Anna. Sorry. Um, so the question here was to do with um, what strategies have been successful in ensuring sustainable utilization of groundwater resources and can be replicated as well. I'm sorry, Amanda. I really have a problem to listen to you. Can you repeat it? Um, the question was around what approaches or strategies have been successful in ensuring sustainable utilization of groundwater resources and could be rec and could be replicated elsewhere oh. okay this is uh, i can answer 
<laughs> on, on that with, um, with a paradox, I would like to say. Um, unfortunately, um, the, the capacity of our governments uh, in, in, in the most of the member states of the UN system and the, 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 are very, very weak in uh, putting together governance, adequate uh, structure for, for groundwater resources. Uh, this means that uh, you can have uh, all data available. I mean, this is always a dream of a scientist uh, on uh, the aquifers characteristics uh, um, and, and uh, groundwater resources. So the issue is that if you don't have uh, the capacity of the law institutions, uh, politicians to enforce uh, uh, the the management and in particular the, the governance uh, that means the sustainable development uh, uh, strategy for your region, uh, your country, your sub uh, um, set of, uh, of urban areas. Uh, in that case, uh, um, there, is, uh, there is definitely a gap that is very difficult uh, to, to, to fill. Um, Let's say that uh, uh, you really need uh, all these uh, um, level of, uh, of uh, knowledge in order to be at least uh, very, very close uh, to be able to manage uh, adequately the groundwater resources. You don't need uh, thousands of data, or millions of data, you need to select uh, what are the, the most important information to be provided to decision makers or, or policy makers? And in particular, to try to explain the, the, the difference between governance and management. I mean, real uh, water governance, I would say, not only uh, groundwater, but water governance in general, is a, a real uh, um, set of, of actions that. Uh, have to go with your strategy for sustainable development. In, this means uh, a green uh, economy, uh, agriculture, uh, water use, um, um, industrial development, uh, tourism, etc. So you, you really need to have a, a, a real clear picture. I wanted to, to, to continue a little bit also on something that uh, I think is uh, crucial that is the, the groundwater quality. We are now really, really looking at, uh, um, I mean, uh, the, the, the level of uh, availability of uh, fresh water, good quality. And um, I mean, in the day of uh, the World Toilet uh, Day, um, it is very much important um, to see that um, if um, groundwater is the large, uh, by large, uh, the most uh, um, fresh water with good quality, thanks to the protection, so natural protection of most uh, of the aquifers in the subsoil. Well, uh, when uh, groundwater is contaminated, when the aquifer is contaminated, uh, it's much more difficult uh, to, to, to work uh, on, on the contamination and much more expensive. So definitely, it is much. It's, it's very important to have uh, uh, to prevent and to have a, a precautionary approach on uh, on uh, on on these. Uh, nowadays, uh, we have contaminations uh, by pharmaceutical uh, and new products, so the pops, uh, persistent organic pollutants, uh, new new um, elements. Uh, that uh, we are still uh, uh, trying to understand uh, how um, interact uh, when reaching uh, the aquifer. The soil has definitely a uh, capacity of depuration, auto depuration. So in any case, the water and aquifer remain a very solid um, reservoir for water supply. But as has been said, uh, we are now looking uh, at, uh, at how these new uh, elements that are, I mean, in, intruded in, in, in groundwater resources and aquifer could be better studied. Thank you. 
Thank you, Alice. I, I, we are running out of time, but I'm conscious that there was a question there between uh, the presentation that Ismat gave and Stefan uh, talked about in terms of the, um, the tracking of uh, contamination of um, fecal matter and COVID-19. Um, is this a scientifically disputed fact at the moment still that, uh, that COVID-19 cannot be uh, infectious in wastewater? Um, there seems to be a difference of opinion here. Um, to hear your, your, both of your points of view. Um, if Stephen wants to start, uh, it's fine by me. But my take on 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 the uh, on this is that you have to look in, into these things uh, per country. So when you talk about not finding the infectious virus in uh, uh, wastewater, uh, where there is wastewater treatment, that's okay. But when you talk about that, when you have raw sewage uh, uh, affecting directly the waterways, that's a different story. And you have a huge amount of raw sewage. Just um, uh, to go into the literature with the SARS-1, uh, not the current SARS, not the SARS-CoV-2, with the SARS-1, there were instances that are documented in the literature uh, that showed the possibility of uh, uh, um, uh, contamination via fecal pollution. There's something called the fecal oral route, and there's also the uh, fecal respiratory route uh, of contamination. Um, uh, in my opinion, uh, the reason why this didn't receive as much attention as it should is because most uh, the issue is most prominently likely in countries where uh, active research on the topic uh, uh, should should be done, but it's not being done. So when I say this in the state might not be a main issue, yes, it might not be a main issue. This doesn't mean it's not an issue. It's not a main issue. But when you, you go to a country like Lebanon or Syria uh, or any country in the Middle East that uh, or other country that's suffering uh, from raw sewage pollution, then it might be an issue. Then there's another aspect to it. Uh, when we are talking about a huge population or a, a large population of people, you know, elderly immuno and immunocompromised pe people sharing the same latrine facilities, right? And uh, uh, sharing the same uh, access to polluted water. You know, when, when you flush, uh, not to go to, into detail, but you are creating basically, you're aerosolizing whatever is in there right uh, mm -hmm. and, have, and then people will be sharing that and this has been documented in hospitals by the way this happens in hospitals so uh, because you will have patients and then you will have you know so, so they have found in hospitals around patient uh, bathrooms basically that there's a high concentration of uh, uh, of viral loads all right so um, we cannot I, I we cannot safely uh, and um, uh, uh, exclude the risk especially in those countries. We cannot also superimpose what's happening in de developed nations to developing nations. And that's, you know, when it comes to infectious disease and based on 20 years of work in, uh, uh, on three continents, you know, that's always a problem. You know, even in, the, in, the, in those countries, they want to, you know, to adopt what's happening elsewhere, but you don't have the infrastructure for that to apply to you. So you have to be aware of a heightened risk when it comes to your to, uh, to your population, so that's my take on. Okay, um, th thanks. It's interesting. And Stefan, we you've got time for one last comment. Um, you can address this issue, or you maybe want to address the topic of the of the webinar more directly in terms of sustainable sanitation and climate, and that your own presentation. Do you have something you'd like to end on? Mm. Um. Point number one, yes, Ismat, I totally subscribe. We cannot say that there is no risk. The, the, the point that we don't, we haven't found so much evidence. We are early on this um, SARS-2 um, um, virus. So um, to, 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 to um, summarize um, the point very clearly, the pandemic is adding to the urgency in addressing access to clean water and sanitation, not only to protect our water resources, but also to protect people, uh, increase people's resilience 
to cope with challenges, whether it's in refugee camps in poor urban areas. So this is clearly putting to the top. We, we need to wash hands. We need to have clean water and so on. Now the link <clears throat> on today's topic um, regarding the climate change aspect, again, if we can ensure that people have access to clean water and sanitation, hygiene, they become much less vulnerable, or in the opposite saying, much more resistant in coping with numerous challenges, including climate change. So there are these two-fold um, elements, number one being Yes, there's opportunity to, for more reuse of water, nutrients, and energy, what comes from uh, sanitation, from wastewater, from solid waste, and so on. And there is this issue of strengthening resilience because you, you, you have enough clean water and hygienic act sanitation so that you're not spreading disease within your neighbors. So thank you very much to, to all the team, all the other presenters for this very um, important topic. And there might be even scope, um, Scott, for, for more in-depth uh, discussion if this is of should be of interest to the IWRA community. Thank you very much. Oh, thank, thanks, Stefan. And, and what I've really enjoyed about all the stories and experiences today is the common thread between all the presentations. In all cases, uh, people are involved as both the causes of the problems and the potential providers of the solutions. And as a race, we've taken our environment for granted a little too long. Um, but it's not too late. Too late. There's been a lot of good uh, technical solutions. Um, and one of the most uh, problem areas is in sanitation. It's in, and it's in the inability of authorities to get to grips with the problem coupled with the social and cultural barriers involved in changing people's way of doing things. The governments have a strong role and an obligation to protect and respect people's rights when it comes to providing safe and sustainable sanitation. But then communities can also play a leadership role in managing the problem by encouraging the right behaviours. And when it comes to climate adaptation, understanding local problems and finding local solutions is a, is a great way to start. And lastly, I'd like to thank all the speakers today for their fascinating presentations. I'd also to thank Scott very much for inviting us all today on behalf of IWRA, and many thanks to you all. I'd like to pass back to Scott now for the final close. Hi, well, thank you so much for your uh, really great job there moderating, Amanda. Uh, that, I think was, I, I feel your feelings and your sentiments of it's been a really fascinating and great uh, presentation. I really appreciate everyone coming together today, both our audience and our panel, um, uh, to, to make this a really great and special uh, World Toilet Day. So again, I'd like to thank our panel. So a big thank, uh, thank you to Amanda Lothen, the Chief Executive Officer at Human Right to Water in Switzerland, uh, Alice Arulli, uh, Chief Groundwater Systems and Settlement Section of UNESCO IHP in France, uh, Dana Iskirva, uh, Executive Director of Earth Forever in Bulgaria, Ismat Kassim, who is assistant professor at the University of Georgia uh, in the United States, and Stefan Ruder, a member of the board of the Fecal Sludge Management Alliance in the Netherlands. So I know that some of our panel and uh, the IWA itself were all on Twitter and social media. So uh, feel free to look us up uh, and follow them if you're interested uh, and learn more and to engage. I know that a few of you didn't have your questions answered, so please feel free to um, reach right out to our panelists uh, look them up online and uh, send them a quick message uh, if you have any further details or thoughts or want to engage with them in any way. I know they're all very friendly, so I'm sure they will get back to you pretty quickly. But not to put you on any spot here, guys, um, but uh, I'm sure they'd be very happy. Um, so if these um, presentations have left you interested in learning more, uh, go ahead and check out our LinkedIn webpage as well. Uh, you can continue the discussion there. Um, and I really hope that everybody in our audience found the insights provided by our panel uh, during this special uh, very, very helpful. Uh, I know it gave me a lot of uh, material to think about in my coming days, and I hope it's generating a lot of creativity for your own work, uh, whatever that work might be uh, as well. So just remind you, everyone, again, that this webinar was brought to you by the International Water Resources Association. We're an almost 50-year-old nonprofit, non-governmental educational organization. We focus on bridging disciplines and geographies and connecting professionals, students, individuals, corporations, and institutions, everyone who's concerned with the sustainable use of the world's water resources. 
So if you're interested in learning more about the association and becoming a member, or you'd like to rewatch the event uh, or look at the slides, please go to www.iwra.org. So on behalf of the whole IWRA office, thank you for viewing the webinar. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 It was a pleasure. Bye. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. Bye. Thanks.